Go Thank ahead. you, Daniel, for the introduction. Hello, good morning. Still. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, for today, I want to talk about two topics uh, which might seem a little bit, you know, sort of quite different. Why does, what does meshing have to do with virtualization and then also with Camoilio? <laughs> uh, but you're going to see that we're using uh, these things uh, together and also oh, all of them uh, uh, together. So, well, I wanted to do the introduction about myself, but... Daniel already did a great job. Um, so in a nutshell, we're working on uh, this project called OpenEPC. This came after we uh, developed in R&D the OpenIMS core. Now OpenIMS is, uh, I think the better name would be Kamailio IMS uh, uh, for it. And um, OpenEPC changed a little bit the, the target. So we were not looking anymore at the service platform, so to say, for uh, telephony core networks, but we were looking at how to provide a seamless IP connectivity uh, uh, yeah, system. So um, what we build today uh, are small customized uh, networks, but the software uh, we learned from Kamailio so much, well, you know, back then it was called C++ router, uh, then OpenSAR and, and so on, uh, but we learned from that architecture, so the same software that uh, works on uh, small networks actually can scale very nicely to very, very big ones, you know, um, tens of millions of subscribers. So, Coordinate to Dynamics actually started um, with this idea of providing this uh, specialized network, this professional mobile radio. Um, so, don't confuse it a little bit with what Ole was talking about. <laughs> uh, this is um, about replacing those well, they're not used anymore, but these big walkie-talkies that uh, you might have seen policemen walking uh, around with. Now they do walk around with iPhones and so on, which is a little bit more scary, uh, I think. Um, but you should also look what's the coverage for those walkie-talkies and then get a little bit more scared. So, uh, uh, but what we tried to do and where we started was this idea of, okay, they like the mobile phones, they have apps now, the firefighters also. So why not would they have their own mobile network? Um, here that we built this uh, architecture where you have these cells that are self-contained and they have both the, the mobile network, so, uh, well, for these special purposes, we looked at LTE as being the cool low latency technology but uh, 2G, 3G might also work. Uh, it's just that it's no longer so interesting. Um, and then on top of that, have IMS, which is basically Kamailia to handle uh, voice, to handle SMS, video, and uh, whatnot. Um, and these units where we started were, was, you know, that we said, okay, we're gonna mash them around so that when you deploy this thing, you don't need to think like a big telco. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, we had already this backpack demonstrated here at Camailio World, where you had everything in one box, the LTE cell core, uh, the telephony core, and you could basically attach a regular mobile phone to it and, uh, and do calls. So that's also very exciting about uh, Camailio, but I'm not gonna talk about that part, voice over LTE. I did that last year. Um, so if anyone in the room doesn't know this, Kamailio can handle LTE telephony. Yeah. Um, so um, what I'm gonna try to, to focus more is to change a little bit the idea about how we deploy networks today. So this is the typical uh, way that you would look at it when you would say, oh, I want a mobile network. So let's start with, data with the data center, lots of servers in there, let's install a lot of components, obviously not big vendor names in here. We're gonna use Camailio, <laughs> OpenEPC, and so on. Um, then build your backhaul so that you reach your cells. The cells might be far away. So a lot of microwave uh, probably there, um, if you're lucky, fiber. But uh, let's face it, actually a lot of the networks today, sometimes they have an LTE cell connected over a DSL link or something like that, which, yeah, is it? 
150 megabit per second at least, or we hear now that the mobile phones can get to up to a gigabit per second, so ah, very difficult on the backhaul. And then finally, the big antenna uh, there uh, with the big base, base station and so on. And when you've done that, you just realize that you want another data center for geo-redundancy purposes and your costs keep adding up uh, just to start up with, with, with that. So we, you know, just using those uh, public safety concepts, we went ahead and we started to theorize a little bit about that. So what's actually the smallest core network or the smallest entire complete mobile network that would be useful? Um, and of course you have things like ad hoc <coughs> networks that uh, you could build there. We know, um, I'm talking about, you know, um, Wi-Fi for example or there are some new concepts coming up about device to device, phones talking to each other directly without using a, a tower, but invariably they have ad advantages and also disadvantages when you look at you know, power usage, coverage, and so on. So we settled on this um, unit of functionality where we say you're gonna have one base station, one LTE antenna, or well, 2G, 3G also if you wish to still go that path, um, and then Collocated with it, we're going to have OpenEPC, which is the, the you know the software that provides the IP connectivity. Then you have Kamailio to to deal with uh, voice and SMS. You have even local breakouts. You could provide internet services or any kind of uh, you know uh, IP services directly in the box or linking to other things outside there, um, and then connect this unit of functionality to others by using a mesh so that uh, configuration would be reduced to a minimal. So dealing with these networks, we realize that actually they have a lot of advantages that make them usable beyond just that little use case of uh, public safety, for example, or professional mobile radio. In that case, you were looking at maybe 100,000 subscribers or something like that. Um, so all of a sudden we got the bigger operators looking at it and saying, well, okay, but can you scale this? Because this gets interesting. Why? Because you know, you're deploying as you grow. You don't need to build all these big data centers um, before you actually deploy just a few cells. Then you have this you know, local breakout at the cell, which means you have proper low latency. You're not going half away uh, through, uh, you know, around the country just to have breakout and then coming back, let's say, you know, you have a sensor and then you have an actuator or something like that, you know, just keeping uh, with the IoT trends. Uh, you don't have to go with the, the signaling between those two halfway around the country just to come back and, and do the operation. So you can keep latency low. Um, you have local services, so it's practical now to deploy these things over a satellite. Um, you have, uh, you know, well, for this to work, though, you have to figure out how to make uh, routing to be self-organized. So that's where the mesh comes uh, in, in play. And also, um, all of a sudden, you don't have one network. You have a thousand small networks, which, by the way, have to act like one network again because the phones are not going to jump like crazy and do roaming between them. So we have to propagate the configuration properly between them. Um, and then we also have distributed mobility, and um, we, we really believe in such a uh, deployment uh, concept. Yeah. And I think, um, where's Ole? He disappeared. He was, you know, going after the reliability, the resilience. Well, think about this. Uh, if one of these nodes goes out, it's not your whole network get, that gets affected. It's just that cell that, that is affected. And we can do a lot of things about it. We can connect that cell to a neighboring one and use that core there. So we're moving from a concept of a centralized network to a decentralized one where uh, basically uh, uh, we have this functionality distributed so that if something goes wrong, you can switch to another one. I'm already half through my uh, time, I guess. Right, so I'm not gonna uh, bore you to that with all the uh, nitty gritty details, but I chose uh, two, three of them um, just to exemplify a little bit uh, how we solved some of the problems and you know that actually it is practical to, to run such a network. First of all, mobility. 
you're moving you know, with your phone from one uh, cell to another. Um, by handling the, you know, this, this, this uh, procedure as one network, we managed to do a roaming handover that looks like a cell-to-cell -cell horizontal handover. And we also do PDN mobility, yeah? which means in Camellia, we don't have to send signaling anymore to have that call going. Yeah? So audio keeps on going um, uh, during this uh, procedure, even without having to, to signal to, to Camellia. But then we also want to re-anchor the, the, the client in the new node as soon as possible. Yeah? We could do this during the call, but you, know, that you risk disruption. Or uh, most of the time, we do it after the call. When we see that the user uh, completed the call, then we tell it to basically reattach to the new node. So every one of these elements runs its own instance of Camellia. So um, you know, no matter where it comes, it can be fully serviced uh, there locally. Then configuration uh, synchronization. Um, we, uh, you know, we design such a system that when you come with a new node, it actually pulls the configuration from the other ones. And um, from trials and so on, we realize that you're not doing that many configuration changes to be concerned that this becomes you know, a big problem. So um, you have, anyway, um, in these networks, in every node, maybe a thousand users, actually restarting Camailio that has that state in memory, it's so fast. <laughs> None of the users are going to uh, realize that. So uh, we just use very simple um, you know, uh, exchange of the configurations uh, between these node, nodes to, to, to propagate changes. And we still have a history there, you know, just to <laughs> make sure that um, yeah, you have um, conflicting configurations maybe coming from two ends of the network. They come uh, you know, together, you have to decide which one wins, but still you don't want to lose the other one, so configuration uh, history is important. Or provisioning subscribers. Um, well, you don't have to do it like this, right? This is a little bit of an extreme case where you would provision actually a SIM card at the cell, you know, you just put a smart card reader there, you put a SIM card in, well, you need somebody authorized to do this, but think about the village use case. You know? You want to have a network that is self-sustained. So um, in any case, maybe you were just enrolling a new uh, node. Well, the idea is that once you did that, this configuration gets propagated to all the other databases around so the user can attach to, to any network. You could also do double provisioning, uh, but most of the time uh, you would do wait for that uh, to be propagated to the remote node. Uh, using double provisioning only if these networks stay disconnected for a very long uh, time. So these were um, some examples of you know, uh, the problems that we solved and how uh, we, we solved them uh, to make it uh, practical to have such a uh, distributed network happen. So now I would like to make the switch to the second part of the, of the, of the talk today to hand over to uh, Giuseppe. Um, so I talked first about using mesh networks. So you know, we're moving sort of here uh, and uh, using the advantages of mesh networks to, um, uh, to make deployments of such a mobile network uh, actually uh, easy to, to deal with. The second part is that, well, you know, <coughs> before we had one big, very big mobile network to deal with. Now we have maybe a thousands, all of, you know, hundreds of mobile networks to deal with. So it's very important to use proper tools and, and so on in deploying these elements or else it just becomes a nightmare of, uh, for, for managing that. And that's why uh, we believe that you need state-of-the-art orchestration and I will hand over to Giuseppe. Okay, thank you, Dragos. Hello, everybody. So before actually jumping directly into the topics, I would like to present you today a few words about uh, what we do usually on our daily business. So I come from the, I'm a PhD student at the Technical University of Berlin. However, we strongly collaborate with the Fraunhofer Focus Institute. And in particular, we, we build new prototypes coming from different areas, uh, also from, let's say, from different uh, domains. And in particular, to, so I think Daniel already presented this morning the, the SIP Express router as one of the initial platforms also 
uh, which was uh, developed at the Fraunhofer Focus Institute. But today I will concentrate more towards the uh, Open Button project, which is a uh, open source project started recently, well, two years ago, and uh, focusing a particular domain. So I probably most of you know, I've heard the buzzword, net, network function virtualization, uh, which is uh, actually is uh, from, let's say from the Camaillo point of view, probably is not so much an innovation, I would say, because it's mainly from an operator's perspective, moving from hardware-based appliances to software-based um, network functions. Okay, so the first point is that operator needs to have uh, um, different type of infrastructure. They want they want to have common hardware, infra common hardware, and deploying on demand on top of this common hardware. Um, Network functions. This is all about so virtualizing the networks, virtualizing even the the functionalities that are provided by these uh, components on top. So the idea is to simplify the management and orchestration of all these components. So we have at the at the bottom the data centers, which are usually uh, cloud-based, and on top of that, that we need some some other tools to control and configure the these so-called network services. And uh, the operators, of course, are looking forward for those kind of solutions because they will reduce cap and, capex and opex. And in particular, they are looking forward to to use more and more open source solutions for their production networks. Anyway, a few words about the the let's say before going to details about the other um, the architecture and so on. Few words about the the, um, the idea. So we have, uh, from the point of view of a service, we define a service as a composition between different uh, elements, and the point is that uh, those elements may come also from different type of uh, software components. So each software component may be managed on a different way, and uh, we compose those services together. And here you can see a typical voice over LT uh, type of service. Uh, where, for instance, IMS could be the one provided by the Camellio um, project. And the, issue, the, the, the idea is to uh, make that deployable on top of virtualized elements. And therefore, you need to have an infrastructure graph, so which, which is somehow describing how the, the infrastructure looks like. So you will have virtual machines, virtual networks, and uh, probably virtual storage for that. The point is that uh, these, two these two different graphs have to be managed on demand and they have to be uh, orchestrated. And all these, these functions could be having completely heterogeneous um, type of management systems. That's why in 2012, so operators introduced the, the, this, this architecture for NFE. Okay, so we have different layers. I will not have the time for describing all the layers. But what I want to mention is that uh, the idea is to somehow uh, create a, a, um, a structured way to uh, control the, those network functions. So these could be network functions coming from independent uh, vendors as well. But in the ideal, you could even think about each of them being a different Camellio instance with different type of modules. So you will need to control how these uh, instances are deployed. So Dragos mentioned the, the point about deploying them even in different geographical locations. So the idea is that via one single framework, I will be able to control the, the deployment and orchestrate uh, the life cycle of those elements on top of different heterogeneous resources. Of course, the problem is that there are many solutions, many open source solutions. And if you start looking at how do I do it, how do I get started? You will be probably looking at starting from configuration management tool, Puppet, Chef, SoulStack. You will need to select one of them. Same for uh, virtualization technologies, KVM, also Docker with containers. So the point is that it's becoming very, very, very complex. So the idea is what we are trying to do with the, our project is to simplify, meaning that with a single component, with a single uh, management system, you will be able to deploy on top of heterogeneous uh, type of infrastructures and all, also possibly make use of different kind of uh, management tools. So our project uh, also follows the HCNV specification. So we provide, so we are following the HCNV specific specification for providing a modular architecture that 
with plug and play mechanism can allow you to deploy on top of, for instance, OpenStack for uh, cloud data centers or even on Docker for container orchestration. And uh, time is running out, so I will go directly to a particular use case that uh, this is why we are having a joint presentation here. So we are orchestrating the OpenAPC um, components together with the Camellio IMS components. And we are also auto-scaling them. Auto-scaling in the sense that the, these components are deployed on top of a cloud data centers. There, is some, uh, there are some monitoring uh, metrics that are pushed towards the monitoring system. In this case, we use Zabbix as a monitoring server. And therefore, the, the auto-scaling engine from the Open Button project is checking whether some policies are matched or not and it decides to trigger some scaling actions. For instance, when some, there is an increasing number of users, an increasing number of subscribers, the idea is that the, the auto-scaling engine tr triggers a, a scale-out action so that a new instance of, for instance, a PDN gateway or serving gateway or even the, a new PCSCF will be instantiated on demand no matter whether it is on OpenStack or no matter what, what, what the location where you want to deploy. So this is a, um, an ideal proof of concept that we are, we are developing together. And uh, I hope pretty soon there will be also a contribution towards the Camellio community with some a scripting that could be reused by you for deploying on demand uh, the Camellio IMS using OpenBaton. So this is almost everything and I thank you also, for sure. Yeah, thank you uh, for your attention. I should also mention that it's not just OpenStack. Uh, in this small box, is actually we're using Docker and containerized deployments, um, just because the small boxes are actually uh, power efficient ARM, <laughs> uh, you know, ARM-based uh, system on a chip, typically, or we run inside the, the the base stations. You do the demo now or at the table, or? No, unfortunately, I think the demo is not even at a table yet. Okay. We hope it's going to be here in the next hours. Okay. Uh, would be great, you know, just uh, drop by to see it. Uh, we try to put everything on a Pico cluster. Uh, this is a nice, you'll see a nice uh, transparent box with having, they're not Raspberry Pis, but they're sort of like that, five of them in there. So uh, it's a very cool uh, mini data center that can take a lot of load, actually. So it's coming by truck, it's why it's <laughs> You know, we, we don't have batteries this time, but... Okay. You know, I guess, okay, it's, you so know, Berlin is very far away. So. Thanks, Dragos. Thanks, uh, Giuseppe. Questions quickly about uh, this, and I have seen the demo. It's... Uh, you wanted the questions? Oh, no? Okay. Sorry. Um, for um, uh, this um, integration, so... Can you elaborate a bit? Because I saw it's more like, uh, they call one? it marketplace, but you call it like extension. So you can actually build your own. What that implies is like uh, having some rules that you have to write XML or YAML or so on yep. extending uh, open button. So yeah, the idea is that um, there is not too much time to go too much in details. I, I sk skipped a lot of parts. But the idea is that each of these elements is so-called a VNF package. And for that, there is the information model coming from Etsy, however, as well as the uh, Tosca definitions. Uh, Tosca provides you uh, with an XML file so you can define what you want to deploy. And once you define these uh, Tosca XML files, you will give it to the orchestrator, <laughs> and the orchestrator takes care, let's say, of deploying that, depending on the, the type of uh, cloud you use or depending on different kind of constraints that you put in the descriptors. Yeah, it's YAML-based. Uh, YAML-based and then you define these like building rules and deploying rules and that's uh, nicely integrated. So I can see for the next edition some new extension modules for RTP engine, Janus gateways and all the other cool application around here. Yeah, I think it's just the example that gets it started and then it hopefully gets into that sort of what we're hoping for, a sort of a marketplace for, for uh, these network applications. You know, the next sort of, you don't want to deal with Debian RPM packages when you're deploying uh, a service in your network. So this is the next step, so to say. 
So you define the modules and then you select where to be installed, distributed on top of OpenStack and also the clouds available there. Or Docker. On, or, or Docker or so. Yeah, Amazon or... Okay. okay. Thank you, Dan. Just to not be late for lunch.